witness this afternoon is uh, Mr. William Colby, who has been up on Capitol Hill before. And, uh, in fact, you've uh, walked up quite a few hills and down again, it seems to me, Mr. Colby, in the uh, uh, last few days, weeks, and maybe even hours. I, I'm not sure of the perils of Colby today, but uh, uh, it's an interesting subject matter. I would like to state before we start, uh, not only my appreciation for your being here, but my conception of what you have done in the last uh, few weeks and months. There is a, a great deal of, of commentary and comment about whether or not the uh, director of Central Intelligence has been, quote, forthcoming, end quote, and that's the word that is used all the time, as to your uh, relations with Capitol Hill. Uh, I've heard comments to the uh, effect that you have been too forthcoming with Capitol Hill. It has been my own experience and judgment that if you are asked precisely the right question, you will give an honest answer. Uh, you do not lead us into those areas which would help us know what the right question was to ask. Uh, you do not make it easy for us to answer uh, the right question. Anyone who thinks that you have been running back and forth to Capitol Hill with briefcases bulging with secrets which you are eager to bestow upon us hasn't sat on my side of the desk. And uh, I, in my judgment, you have done a very responsible job for your agency at a time when your agency had great problems and uh, I welcome you back here, not as a friend, but as a respected adversary. And uh, I, I feel that that is the relationship which we have had. I think that you have the same concept of the Constitution of the United States, which is shared by most of the members of this committee. And uh, I just personally uh, want to say that uh, I'm Glad that you're here and glad that you will sort of uh, see the agency through these next few weeks. Uh, Mr. Murphy. Short uh, and strong amen to what you just said. Uh, I've read, too, have read the commentaries. I've found Mr. Kobe, as you have indicated, doing nothing other than his job as he sees it as an American. And I think that he's a man of integrity. Uh, we have a responsibility in this government, co equal with the executive branch and seeing that the rights of Americans aren't violated. And I'd just like to add that I think Mr. Colby is a fine and decent man, and I think uh, the president would do well to consider his previous actions. Uh, it, it is my uh, understanding, Mr. Colby, that you have an opening statement to give us this afternoon on our basic subject matter, which uh, comes under your heading of, of personnel and my heading or our heading of risks, and what we are interested in looking at is where the CIA has people stashed away throughout the United States of America and, and overseas, and I realize that some of this will have to be done in executive session, but I would like to stay in open session as long as we can. Please proceed. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and thank you for the remarks. Mr. Chairman, uh, CIA personnel, when they go overseas, uh, obviously must go under some other title. Uh, this is, uh, in some cases, a title of another agency of the government. In some cases, it is of some other title outside of the government. For reasons of continuity, CIA personnel uh, in sometimes have to retain that identification while they serve a tour within the United States. Uh, this, uh, this is a headquarters tour, and they are not using that to cover for another reason during that period, but merely to provide some continuity. 
There are certain activities that we have done within the United States that do need some other identification than CIA. I think I've explained on previous occasions the need for for covering a security investigation so that it does not highlight the fact that the, the person being investigated will shortly become a member of the CIA because we do not want that reputation to be around. But I think uh, you have asked to two particular areas be covered, Mr. Chairman. One, the subject of details to other government agencies as distinct from the use of other covers, other agencies cover. And secondly, the relationship with uh, the field of journalism generally uh, uh, in our operations. With respect to the last uh, part of that, uh, the journalist area, Mr. Chairman, I obviously cannot go into detail as to the identifications or the people involved, but I think I can sketch a few general points here uh, within which uh, we can go into full detail in the executive session. In the first place, as people equally interested in foreign affairs, CIA people and journalists frequently run into each other and exchange ideas. Uh, this occurs both abroad, in our stations abroad, and in, in the United States. In the past uh, year, for example, uh, CIA has, has uh, received in our building for discussions of foreign events uh, some uh, about a hundred journalists for a detailed discussion and analysis of some foreign situation. Uh, in that time, we have answered something like 12 or 1,300 telephone inquiries from journalists about some development abroad, some foreign development uh, on which the journalist is seeking the advice that, uh, and the judgments of our analysts about that situation. I think this is uh, both perfectly proper, Mr. Chairman, and I think it is more than perfectly proper. I think it is part of the effort we in CIA are making to ensure that our product is useful, not only to the elements of the executive branch who need it directly, but also to the Congress, where we do make much of our information available to the congressional committees. And we do this on both a regular and periodic basis, and we do it in response to specific requests for testimony on the situation in some foreign situation. Likewise, I think it important that uh, our public benefit from, to the extent feasible, within the limits of the, of the requirement to keep uh, sensitive sources secret, and for that reason we do respond to these journalistic inquiries about some situation abroad. Uh, the numbers I gave you are those in which we discuss the substance. I'm not in including the number of journalists that have been curious about the state of the, of the intelligence community these days, or CIA, or any of those things. That's a totally separate category, and it's a larger, larger total number, I might add. But beyond that, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have over the years used, had a, an operational relationship with a certain number of journalists overseas. We have uh, worked with these people to, again, to help us on our foreign intelligence responsibilities. In some cases, they can provide us information that we ask them about. In some cases, they can make contacts with people that it is difficult for an official of an embassy or a, an American mission abroad to be in touch with. And for this reason, uh, we have on occasion used uh, people who have connections with journalism for this, this purpose. Under our own restraints, we have been very careful about this, and in recent years we have even further uh, strengthened our restrictions on this matter. We have uh, taken particular caution to ensure that our operations are focused abroad and are not deal, uh, focused at the United States in the sense of collecting information about the United States or, on the other hand, influencing the opinion of the American people about things that from, from a CIA point of view. We have dropped contacts and relationships with journalists and others in the past uh, couple of years where we felt that there was some belief that that relationship could be construed as an effort to influence a major circulation American journal, for example, or that uh, a particular project would be aimed at affecting U.S. public opinion through media operations. 
In order to carry out this policy, we have a careful regulatory control procedure in our operations directorate, and our current regulations require the approval of a, of a senior level of the agency when any, with any, with respect to any connection with American journalist or media personnel. Uh, and a, as a further matter of policy, even with those journalists that we do deal with, and it is a very small number, which I would certainly give you in the executive session, Mr. Chairman, we do not attempt to influence what they put in their U.S. journals. What they do with respect to their own journal is their business, and we do not, we do not tell them what stories to write or what uh, subjects to cover. We do not, uh, at this time, employ any staff members of regular U.S. general circulation journals. Uh, you may recall there was some publicity a couple of years ago at which I undertook the commitment to terminate any such relationships and over these past two years, we have terminated those relationships. We have uh, certain other contacts with people with considerably less connection with, with uh, American journals or considerably less of a, of a standing as a general circulation journal. And those we have continued because we believe that their material does not affect American public opinion in any substantial basis or that their material is viewed as something coming from the outside and something that the journal has a full choice over whether it wishes to keep it or not. Turning to the other subject, Mr. Chairman, the, the subject of detailees. In common with the other agencies of the government, CIA has a program which permits the detail of our employees to other agencies. The detail of agency personnel is approved when the assignment is determined to be beneficial to the career development of an individual or where it can make a contribution to a foreign intelligence-related activity. Employees in, on such details normally continue to receive their agency entitlements during such a detail. In a sense, I was one of those at one time, Mr. Chairman, when I left the agency on leave without pay and served in the uh, Agency for International Development and the Department of State when I was in Vietnam and then later returned to the, to the uh, agency. I was not under cover at that time. I was a detail. Reimbursement to CIA for such details depends upon the individual circumstances of, such, of each detail. If the employee performs agency-related duties or is a participant in a joint operation of a national intelligence program, or is assigned as part of a career development plan, then we will, be re we will reimburse the agency that he works for for his services. If, on the other hand, if he moves totally to another agency and works for it on its functions for a period, uh, where he is essentially doing their work, then they will not be reimbursed during that period. They will, the receiving agency will pay for his full entitlements. I might add here that no such details are affected without a full coordination with the appropriate agent, uh, officials in the agency to which the individual is assigned or detailed, so that there is no penetration of the detail without the knowledge of its senior management. As of uh, 21st of October of this year, there were 104 employees of CIA on detail to other components of the United States government. Of these, we were reimbursed for 27, and we were not reimbursed for 77. Now, there are also times, Mr. Chairman, when uh, CIA has a need for a skill from the, of an individual who comes from another government agency. Uh, the CIA, particularly in its earlier days, was heavily staffed by military personnel who were detailed. And a number of the senior officers in the Army today spent a, a tour of a two or three years in CIA at some point in the early 50s. Also, there may be of activities of common concern to the CIA and to another government agency on a matter of common concern to the intelligence community. If these situations exist, we make arrangements for a reimbursable or a non-reimbursable, depending on the circumstances, detail from the other agency to CIA. 
As of the 21st of October of this year, we had 179 details in from such other agencies of the government, of which we were reimbursed for 80. The others, of course, were non-reimbursed, and the total of 99. I think that gives the overall picture of uh, these two subjects, Mr. Chairman. I'd be delighted to answer the questions and to the degree of which I can. Well, I don't know how far we're going to be able to go in an open session, but we're going to try. Chairman Otis Pike. When did you last have... And now I'm going to withdraw that. Do you now have people who are being paid by the CIA on any thing which you referred to as a major circulation American journal? We have no staff members of any such that major was not general. The question. The question was, do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to anything which you called, quote, a major circulation American journal? Yes, Mr. Chairman, we do. We have some who are, who are in the category of freelancer or stringer or something of that nature abroad individuals who are not considered a part of the staff of that journal. I'm not going to ask you the names or the numbers. I am going to ask you this, however. Do you have any people who are on the staffs of major circulation American journals without, uh, 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 who are contributing to major circulation American journals, who you are paying without the knowledge of the management of the major circulation American journals. Yes, we do. Stringers who are submitting occasional pieces uh, or, or frequent pieces to various journals, uh, that we have not told the management about them, but they are considered as non-staff members of that journal. They're independent contractors. Do you have any people at the present time who are paid full-time by the CIA, who also write for major circulation American journals. We do have abroad some of our employees who are paid for their services by CIA who also submit pieces occasionally. It's a very small number, but we do have people who submit pieces to other to American journals. Do you have any people paid by the CIA who are working for uh, television networks? This, I think, gets into the kind of uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into in executive session. I, I, uh, I think if we begin to break the question down into the component parts, we begin to focus things a bit. Well, when you refer to major circulation American journals, are you referring to both written media and visual media? Yes, I do. I'm sorry, I should have made that clear. All right. Um, do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to the national news services? And by that, I'm referring to AP and UPI. Well, again, I think we're getting into the kind of detail, Mr. Chairman, that I'd prefer to handle in executive session. Uh, Mr. McClory. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to uh, welcome... Robert McClory, a Republican from Illinois. These are the House Intelligence Hearings from Washington. Uh, delighted I am at the news reports that you are willing to remain on uh, for a while as the Director of Central Intelligence and Head of the CIA. And I want to, uh, I want to state, state very forthrightly 
that uh, I think the cooperation that you have provided, the information you provided through your testimony and through the cooperation you provided through your agency has been uh, invaluable insofar as the work of this committee is concerned, and I commend you for it, and uh, I want to personally express my appreciation to you uh, for the very professional, the very high level, and uh, the very cooperative way in which you have uh, uh, behaved as a, as a public official and one who is uh, uh, responding to extensive inquiry by this select committee of the, of the Congress. Sorry. Uh, with respect to the subject of detailees, uh, I have in my hand a, a document which I understand has been declassified and which you may have uh, before you, and if uh, you permit, I would like to ask you questions about it. Uh, it uh, relates to political aspects of an individual uh, who was assigned to the National Security Council staff. And if it, uh, I would like to confirm, first of all, that that has been declassified. Yes, Mr. McCrory. Uh, the person's name is Chester Cooper. Was Chester Cooper in 1964, uh, while serving as Assistant Deputy Director for Intelligence for Policy Support uh, in the Central Intelligence Agency, assigned to the White House uh, as a detailee? He was a CIA employee who was assigned to the White House, to the National Security Council staff, I believe. And uh, he worked uh, at the White House with Mr. Uh, McGeorge Bundy on the national security matters, and during that time he uh, also participated in drafting campaign speeches on international issues uh, uh, which were delivered by President Johnson and by other senior officials. As a member of the NSC staff, he primarily worked on intelligence matters related to the Vietnam and Chinese affairs, which was his specialty at the time. During that period, he he did assist in the drafting of certain speeches by the president. And uh, he also participated in the uh, preparation of a fact book which were on national security and other matters which was used by the Democratic National Committee. That uh, is indicated by this report, Mr. McCrory, and I don't uh, contest it. Uh, does the report also indicate that uh, Mr. Cooper was the individual who in 1964 and I think this was ascertained as late as 1973 that he was the individual who was getting advanced copies of uh, uh, candidate uh, uh, Senator Goldwater's speeches and delivering them to the, uh, to, uh, 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 I guess, Democratic uh, uh, personnel, President Johnson, before Senator Goldwater was delivering the speeches. I believe there was an arrangement at that time, Mr. McCrory, by which uh, somebody picked up the copies of uh, Mr. Goldwater's speeches, which uh, had been made available in advance distribution for the press, and brought them to him. They picked them up at the, at the Republican headquarters. Now, uh, at this time, uh, the director of the uh, Central Intelligence was Mr. McCone. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Who is Tracy Barnes? Mr. Tracy Barnes was the chief of the Domestic Operations Division, which was a division which was responsible for certain of our foreign intelligence activities here in the United States. And this memorandum indicates that he's the one that arranged this, uh, yes. this activity of Cooper. It does. Is, where's Tracy Barnes now? And Tra Mr. Barnes unfortunately died uh, several years ago. Now, uh, how do you regard this uh, kind of uh, activity on the part of a detailee, uh, Mr. Colby? I think, uh, Mr. McCrory, this was on the edge uh, somewhere of what he should have been doing and what he shouldn't have. Uh, working in the National Security Council staff, I'm sure he was providing his experience and his assistance to the to the National Security Council and to the President uh, in that position. Well, even though we regard the President of the United States, whoever he happens to be, as the one who is in charge of the National Security Council and of the intelligence uh, community, uh, it uh, would not be appropriate. Would it be, in your opinion, for uh, a, 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 a CIA employee to be uh, getting advanced copies of speeches by a, uh, an opposing candidate and delivering them to the I president? Think, I think that was improper, Mr. McClory, no question. I draw the distinction between that aspect of this report and the aspect of his working as a part of the, of the National Security Council staff on these matters. Uh, these, the matters that he was an expert on were 
was such a prominent part of the whole uh, activity at the White House at that time that it was probably very difficult for him to distinguish between what was proper support to the president and what was political. i just ask this one further question. As, as director of the CIA, you wouldn't countenance this kind of activity? I certainly would not countenance picking up speeches uh, and giving them to, to uh, uh, speeches by another candidate and uh, giving them to the, to the White House. No, I, I, my time is up. Thank you. Mr. Dallums. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Colin Dillons, a Democrat from California, questioning William Colin. In the past several years, several full-time employees of major domestic um, media instruments were also full-time employees of the Central Intelligence Agency. I think I can answer that better, Mr. Dillons, in executive session. Uh, I think that... Uh, I'd, I would rather answer it in the executive session, if I may. Well, I have a series of additional questions that would follow on to that in the executive session. I have here, uh, Mr. Colby. Do you have further response to that? No. I have two books here. One is the Pinkovsky Papers, and the other is the New Class by Prager Printers. What part did the CIA play in writing, publishing, and or distributing either one or both of these books? I would like to discuss that in executive session, if I may, Mr. Delamus. I don't know, Mr. Chairman, whether it's appropriate to ask the question of uh, uh, whether what is your explanation of white, black, and gray media operations. Would that also be more appropriate in executive session, or can you talk about it generally in open session? I can describe that. Uh, this was a, a set of definitions that was worked out within the government about 15 years ago, more or less. White propaganda would be propaganda which is clearly attributed to, the, uh, to its originator, something like Voice of America, uh, something of that nature. The uh, gray propaganda is material which is not attributed to the originator, and which there is some other attribution of the of the or, or, origin origin of the uh, material. Black propaganda is material which is attributed to the target itself. In other words, a a document which is uh, pretends to be. Uh, we have we have had a number of those kinds of documents which were looked into by a House committee some years ago, distributed in Africa, alleging to be American. Foreign Service telegrams and, and messages uh, put out to, with communist support. We are we know that uh, at that time, the document was a falsely attributed to the United States. It was designed to show the United States in some bad uh, light and, and, uh, of, or other. That would be an item of black propaganda. Thank you. Has the CIA ever planted or leaked stories to foreign press sources? And uh, if the answer to that question is yes, uh, were any of the stories false or in any way misleading? As a part of our, our covert propaganda responsibilities, Mr. Dellums, we have uh, provided a certain amount of information all over the world in, foreign, in the foreign press. Has the CIA ever, fi ever financed, published, or controlled, at least in part, newspapers, news services, journals, or periodicals in foreign nations? And if so, uh, what was your general purpose? Again, as a part of our responsibilities for covert political and propaganda action abroad, uh, the answer in a very broad sense is yes, and I would like to go into detail in the executive session. Thank you. Has the CIA ever asked U.S. journalists to write a particular story or express CIA selected information? Uh, with respect to foreign journalists and uh, for foreign uh, publication, the answer is uh, yes. U.S. journalists. The, 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 with respect to American journals, the, the newsmen that uh, we were discussing earlier, we make a particular point of not instructing them as to what they should write in the American uh, media that they write for. Has the CIA ever asked uh, a media network or journal to uh, ever kill a story? I uh, spent a great deal of my time in, uh, earlier this year trying to 
get that done, Mr. Dellums. I think that's... Uh, <laughs> Is that the only end? <laughs> no, I, uh, there have been other times. There have been times I have appealed to, to the responsibility of uh, journalists uh, in America not to run a story. Would well, the gentleman yield break you, to my colleague? Has there been any times in the last uh, two weeks? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> quite. I've uh, asked this question several times, and I'm not sure if I've ever gotten a clear, clear answer, but can you explain the nature of the relationship between the CIA and Prager Publishers? I would rather go into that in detail in an uh, in executive session, Mr. Dillon. Has the CIA ever covertly assisted the publication, distribution, or writing of any article, book, or media presentation in the United States? Now, I may have missed your earlier comments. That I I think I really have to explain that in executive session. I, I revert to my point that any activity we do in this field is aimed abroad, but I must uh, explain the details of that in, uh, in executive session. Time of the gentleman has expired. Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Morgan Murphy, a Democrat from Illinois. CIA officers are uh, assigned to the BNDD and its successor, the DEA. Uh, yes, there were certain at various times, Mr. Murphy. And how about the DEA, DIA? DIA? DIA. Yes. Uh, how, the, the same answer to the Treasury Department? Yes. Are these CIA detailees ever asked to report back to the CIA as to what was happening at the organization in which they were detailed? Well, certain of the CIA officers detailed to those organizations are detailed as liaison officers, in which case their function is to make sure that there's a full exchange of information in the, between the two agencies on that job. Uh, certain of them, however, are assigned to work in that area for a time, and they are uh, given over to the full command authority of the organization to which they're sent. Were there any CIA detailees, and, and possibly we can only go into this in executive session, detailed to cabinet officers in any administration? Yes, uh, certain occasions. Uh, On a permanent basis, say a secretarial level or administrative assistant level. I can think of one uh, secretary that was detailed uh, to the White House at one point, and an individual later became a cabinet officer and asked to, that she assist him in his new job. He knew, he knew, he knew at all times what she was, of course, in her background. Were there any of the uh, members of cabinets that had uh, CIA detailees that were unaware of their status as a CIA agent or a former employee of the CIA? Well, as for former, I cannot say. Uh, when they leave CIA and take another job somewhere else, uh, CIA does not follow them uh, or, or make any arrangements. As for current employees, any CIA detailee to, a, to another agency is revealed to the management of that agency. Now, uh, I think we uh, established the fact that there were some detailees of the CIA uh, detailed to the White House. Is that correct? There are, yes. And would they be reporting back on a regular basis to the CIA as to uh, any and all activities within their purview in the White House? No, they. Uh, I have instructed. Uh, I have instructed at least two or three of them that I know of that they are not to report to me what they learn in that job, except that. They, to the extent that the uh, that their employers, their current employers, want them to do so. Some of them, as I say, are liaison officers, and for that reason, they are passing on decisions and passing on questions that uh, that they want to have studied from an intelligence point of view. Are any of your uh, CIA people used as interpreters in high-level discussions between uh, foreign heads of governments and our and our government? My Deputy General Walters has a reputation as one of the foremost interpreters in the world, and uh, he has served, I think, almost every president in that uh, position. Uh, he is a military officer. He was an attaché before and over a number of years, but since he has become the Deputy Director of Intelligence, he has on occasion served as interpreter. Could we, in executive session, uh, Find out, uh, well, I'll, I'll ask in an executive session. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Treen. David Treen, a Republican from Louisiana, questioning William Colby. Mr. Colby, the 
1964 activity that Mr. Uh, McClory referred to, do I understand, and this has just come to my attention, so I'm not very familiar with the material that's been presented to us, but do I understand that the woman who picked up the copies of Senator Goldwater's speeches in the summer of 1964 was an employee of the CIA herself? I believe, yes. Employed by the Domestic Operations Division? Yes. Uh, who is this woman? I don't know the name right now, Mr. Treen. I'm sure I could find it out. And, uh, do we know if she's still employed by the CIA? She is apparently retired. She is a retired CIA retired. employee. Uh, but she can be identified, but we simply don't have her name at this time. Is that is that correct? She was interviewed uh, in the course of the Watergate hearings, in which I think some of this uh, came up at one point for some reason. Can anyone at the witness table tell us who this woman was? I would, I would like to supply the name. I don't know the name offhand. You will supply the name. I will supply the name. I have no further questions this time. Uh, Ms. Yes, I'll be pleased to you. Uh, one obvious question, Mr. Colby. Morgan Murphy. Do you detail any CIA employees of this committee or the church committee? No, no Mr. Murphy. <laughs> Although, I'm not sure whether this committee, but I know the church committee has some former employees on it, but uh, I have no connection with them. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, I yield to Mr. Report. Just ask me, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when you detail people to the White House as this... Uh, a uh, person, Cooper, was detailed to the White House. Is the, is the, the president or, or uh, the people at the White House, are they advised that the CIA is putting somebody in the White House? Well, the arrangements are made with the administrative elements there to that they send an, an officer They're not there. secretly at the White House. They're not they're, secretly. They're all overtly at the White House. Clearly a yeah. CIA identification. And we frequently are asked to send somebody and Mr. Cooper was a good example. Mr. Cooper was very well informed on Vietnamese affairs, and, and he went over to help the National Security Council staff on, the, on Vietnamese affairs especially. And uh, then he reports, does he report back to the CIA? A person no, he report, reported at that time to the National Security Council staff. I won't say he never had lunch with an old friend, but he certainly, uh, his, his lines of reporting and his lines of authority were clear. While he worked over there, he worked for the National Security Council. Uh, who approved this operation, Mr. Colby, uh, for this employee of the Domestic Operations Division, this woman? Who approved her activities and going and getting copies of speeches uh, as an employee and delivering them to Mr. Cooper or, to, or through some other channel which ultimately reached Cooper? I believe the record indicates that this was initiated by Mr. Barnes, uh, who is deceased. Is that correct? Who is deceased? Did he have to have approval from a higher up? I I don't believe there's any indication that he ever asked for it or or uh, needed it. Would you examine the records to see if you can find if Mr. Barnes uh, left any evidence of where he got his authority to do this? Mr. I will, Mr. Train. I'd be pleased to yield the chairman. Uh, I, I have no question. There are questions been asked. Uh, Mr. Ashman. Mr. Chairman, just to try, uh, I don't know how many questions I can ask in open session, Mr. Colby, but just a couple of things about the, the stringers that have, um, that are working, or that are paid by the, the CIA. Are those, um, when you recruit people like that, is that at their suggestion or at your suggestion? Do you approach somebody uh, that you think would be useful, or... Do they somehow come to you? Well, both, Mr. Aspen, but uh, any such operation is reviewed very, very carefully by Mr. Nelson as my deputy for operations. Uh, this is not done on the say-so of a subordinate officer somewhere, and uh, a full consideration is, is uh, taken of whether the, the man clearly is not a staff member of a general circulation journal or media, and secondly, that uh, there be no influence on the American um, opinion and press as a result. So nothing that he writes, uh, you, you don't try to influence his opinion of, of things no. that disappear. How about a foreign publication that might appear in the United States, uh, published abroad, but, uh, but is distributed in the United States? 
This is Les Aspen of Wisconsin. Hers. I mean, uh, yeah. you could uh, publish a journal. And, and, of course, if a story appears in a foreign publication, it might be picked up by a wire service in this yes, country as a, a legitimate story. Yeah, it could be uh, at the far end. But that's uh, that's not. Uh, I think that's a purely incidental effect of the of the activity, which is conducted abroad, with its objective abroad and with its impact abroad. But it is possible, at least in these two kinds of instances, that something which has a, a, an impact abroad or its intentions impact abroad could, in effect, become part of the United States' uh, knowledge about the subject. Or yes, but uh, on the basis of a number of years' experience of seeing this. Uh, I can think of the very, very few occasions on which any reference was made to any such event uh, uh, initiated uh, by us abroad for a foreign target. There were very few. The one or two that I can recall, there was some reference to the fact that uh, some event was alleged to have taken place abroad, but uh, nothing of any prominence, nothing that uh, really substantially misled the American people or anything of that nature. Um, in, in that, um, these people are primarily then for, for planning a story abroad, or, or, or are they also for giving us information to? No, they're primarily for intelligence well, collection purposes. And maybe incidentally for planning a story. Of and incidentally, sometimes, yes. Now, when you, you deal with these people, do, you, do they get briefings from, from the CIA, and would they, for example, get classified briefings? Well, we would certainly brief them on behavior so that they could... Uh, conduct their clandestine work safely uh, and so that uh, we would have our relationship and not be revealed uh, in that relationship. At the same time, uh, if they are covering some particular foreign situation, we have uh, one of our officers is obviously going to sit down and debrief the man. In the course of a debrief, they discuss what some target situation is doing. And the, the, there is an exchange of uh, views of what that means, what the significance, what events are apt to take place, and in the course of that, I'm sure some information does go back and forth. Yeah. And, and the question is to me, does the, does the person who is writing the story, does he, is he knowledgeable about what he is doing, his role in this thing, or does he think he's in fact putting out straight information? Oh. Well, I think we've got two things confused now, and this is a very complicated area. but. Uh, in the in dealing with an intelligence collection agent abroad who happens to be have some connection with journals then we will talk with him discuss with him the appreciation of what's going on in that area if we on the other hand come to the idea that we want to have a certain event look as though it's taking place abroad then we might discuss with him just exactly how that thing should be presented so that it will have its best effect in that foreign situation. Is it, does it possible, I mean, is, does it happen that the, uh, you have on, on the payroll in some way uh, a person who writes regularly for a foreign publication, a columnist or something like that? For a foreign publication, foreign publication. certainly. And uh, would it be part of the normal routine to perhaps slip him information and expect that he would therefore write a column from that, that information? On occasion, that is possible. Uh, and, and is it the times when the information that you give him is totally fabricated, uh, documents made up to look like they were uh, authentic when in fact they were totally fabricated? Well, in fact, this, uh, this, I wouldn't say it never happens, but it's a very rare event because if he is going to be successful in that, in that activity, he's got to develop the reputation for reliability that uh, can only come from uh, from having a good, solid base of information. Mr. Milton. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask you now, Mr. Sent to reserve my time. Without objection, the gentleman's time is reserved for the executive. Mr. Chairman, I would like to correct one thing I, I think I may have misstated uh, in the answer to Mr. Treen. Certainly. The question of uh, whether Mr. Cooper reported to us, apparently the record is that there were reports filed by him as to his activities there in the White House while he was working, which were filed with our uh, director, Deputy Director for Intelligence. Uh, Mr. Caston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cooper. Robert Caston, a Republican from Wisconsin. One of our CIA employees detailed to the National Security Council. 
Well, one, uh, one thing, for instance, we detail people to help run the Situation Room, which handles the incoming intelligence. Uh, we detail individuals to help uh, on the consideration of some of the intelligence or, or uh, covert action problems that uh, take place. On some occasions, we detail individuals because they are very competent in their field and are chosen so particularly because of their competence that the National Security Council wants to borrow them and use them because of that skill. Why are intelligence officers from the Directorate of Operations, the covert part of the CIA, always detailed to the 40 Committee? Well, because in I mean, the that normal... particular, the covert operations section. Right. Then normally, the, the work has been, is one of uh, maintaining contact, a liaison, with respect to those covert operations. And uh, an officer deals in that subject and maintains the liaison about those matters. But isn't the 40 committee supposed to be advising, or at least passing judgment on, recommendations for covert operations which would be coming from the CIA? In fact, it would be coming from the CIA Directorate of Operations section, the section that they had just left. No, but the 40 committee is, uh, is, are the principles of the, of the committee. The, the officer that, uh, that acts as the executive secretary of it uh, merely processes the material, makes sure that the right information is at the right time and things of that nature. Oh, well, the, the officer... He's not making a judgment about the things. That's made by the members of the committee, the of officer... which I am one. The officer who serves as the executive secretary of the 40 committee, um, I understand these are undercover people right now, and that we shouldn't use their names, but generally speaking, they leave the DDO, go to work with the 40 committee, the NSC, they, then they come back and they go, they stay working in covert action. Now, it seems that there's a conflict when you're sending a person from the CIA, a, a high-ranking officer in the CIA, he's undercover, he then goes to work advising on covert operations. Uh, isn't there a, a can't he influence decisions? Won't, it's not independent judgment in any way. He would have a special interest in, 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 in one case, if the timing was right, he could have developed the plans for a covert operation, and then next month he becomes the individual advising the 40 committee. He's over in the White House with his other hat. Isn't this a conflict? No, I don't think so, uh, Mr. Kasson. The, the thing is that uh, you take a man who knows something about the subject matter about which he's going to be working. Uh, in other words, covert actions. He understands it. He understands how it works, how, how the machinery works, how the operations take place abroad. He is detailed over there to do the secretary's job, the executive secretary's job for the committee. Uh, he takes a tour there. He doesn't cut his ties with his career. Uh, just by going over there for a time, he comes back and gets reassigned to some other job. Uh, and uh, during the time he's there, though, it is clear that he works for the 40 committee. There's no doubt as to who he's working for. Are, are the members of the 40 committee and other 40 committee staff people aware that their executive secretary is a CIA covert action detailee? Certainly. Certainly. No question about that. They know exactly who he is and that he comes from CIA and that he comes from the, I guess if they're curious, that he comes from the Directorate of Operations. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to yield to Mr. McClory. Uh, I note that there's a uh, roll call vote, and I know that we are about to go into an executive session. I would like to move at this time. There's no objection that uh, we resolve ourselves, uh, the committee, into an executive session. Uh, clerk will call the roll.